Good morning. So this is a lecture on chapter 28, which is the nursing care of patients with lymphatic and hematological disorders. So what we're going to cover here is the pathophysiology of different types of hematological disorders like coagulopathies, um, anemias, leukemias, and then lymphatic disorders. And with lymphatic disorders, we're really going to talk about mostly um, lymphomas and the two different types, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. Talk about the etiology, signs and symptoms, what testing we use to diagnose them, and then what is the therapy, medications, and then nursing care that is involved for all of those. Okay, so get ready kids to have a lot of fun. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is anemia. The word anemia refers to a deficiency of red blood cells. So, or hemoglobin. And remember, when your bone marrow produces red blood cells, they are reticulocytes, which mature into erythrocytes, which become red blood cells, which then pick up iron, heme, and become hemoglobin. Okay? And hemoglobin's only job, its purpose, is to transport or carry oxygen to all your tissues, your organs, your brain, your whole body and pick up the waste, which is the carbon dioxide, to go back to the heart to get pumped to the lungs so your lungs can get rid of the CO2, pick up more oxygen, go to the left side of the heart, and then move through your circulation and do it again. So why do people get anemia? Lots of different reasons. There can be an impaired production of red blood cells, and in that case, something like renal failure, because we need the kidneys to make erythropoietin, in order for the bone marrow to make the red blood cells. So if you don't have erythropoietin because of renal failure, for example, then you wouldn't be producing enough. So that's not a nutritional issue, right? That's a lack of production. Um, there could be destruction that's happening when it's not supposed to be happening. So red blood cells, they have a lifespan of about 120 days. And just to kind of recap and go back and incorporate GI, red blood cells live about 120 days. When they are old, and they've worn out their usefulness, they go to the liver to die. And the liver, I call it kind of the crematorium, right, for the red blood cells, the hemoglobin, because when, they, when the old ones get to the liver, the liver will kind of break them down and take the heme, the iron, away, store it, and then whatever's left kind of just destroy it. And that's bilirubin, right? It is the waste product of those red blood cells that have died, okay? Um, so there can be destruction prematurely. So instead of allowing them to live their 120 days, you know, there's a hemolytic anemia where the body actually destroys the red blood cells almost as soon as they're produced and matured. And then it can be something simple. Well, I mean, we call it simple, but it's not as complicated in etiology, which is blood loss due to a trauma, you know, car accident, a stabbing, a shooting, or surgical hemorrhage, somebody who goes in for an operation and they lose more blood than we anticipate, okay? So when we talk about the causes, for certain anemias, they can be nutritional. In other words, a nutritional anemia means that the patient is not getting what they need for the production of the red blood cells in their diet. Well, that's a pretty easy fix. So I'll give you an example. If somebody is a vegan, vegans do not eat animal products. So no dairy, no eggs, no cheese, right? The only thing they eat are plant-based products. And plant-based products do have some protein in them, but nowhere near as enough, nowhere near enough or as much as animal proteins. And it's a different form of heme. So um, an ATI talks about this a little, so I want to make sure that you understand the concept. Animals... When we eat animals or animal products, those have protein that's really easily absorbed by the body. The body likes that protein, and it's real easily absorbed. If you eat a burger or a steak that's lean, of course, trim the fat, you're getting a whole lot of protein that's readily absorbed for the body. If you are a vegan and you're getting all of your protein from, say, soy, because FYI, the plant that has the most protein that now is almost considered a heme protein are soybeans. Soy, soybeans, and by the way, tofu. Tofu is made from soybeans. So 
vegans have to eat a whole lot of tofu, right, to get the same amount of protein, which becomes iron, right, from eating soybeans or tofu than they would if they ate meat or animal products, okay? So if it's protein, then it's an iron deficiency anemia. If they're a vegan, well, we're not going to change their dietary habits. So we may have to give them a supplement, like a ferrous sulfate, an iron supplement. So make sure you understand all the things associated with ferrous sulfate. If we're giving it orally, they have to take it with vitamin C. Anything that's a citrus juice, this is the time orange juice and grapefruit juice are good because vitamin C helps the body readily absorb the iron supplement. Okay, remember that. Iron is absorbed better when taken with vitamin C containing products like grapefruit juice and orange juice. Iron does not get absorbed well if it's taken with dairy, so no dairy products. Make sure you understand that if we're giving ferrous sulfate as a liquid, elixir, that it's a dark brown color and it will stain your teeth. Tell your patient they should use a straw and rinse their mouth after they take it so that it doesn't stain their teeth. If we're giving ferrous sulfate, which is actually, it can be called dextran, when it's given parenterally, like an IM injection, which by the way, should be given the z track method. Why? Because ferrous sulfate, dextran, when given IM in the deltoid typically, will stain the skin. And so if we give it z track the skin does not get stained. If you don't remember z track you need to go back and look up that so that you know it, because that is something that you must know both for ATI and the boards. Okay. And then there can be vitamin deficiencies because you also need B vitamins, you know, folic acid and vitamin B12. So if it's a, if it's a, um, a deficiency in diet, sometimes we can change that. But if it is pernicious anemia, which we're going to talk about in a minute, then usually they're going to be on B12 injections for the rest of their lives. Um, and then there's hemolysis, which is another etiology. So in other words, so anemia can be because of a diet deficiency. Anemia can be because of hemolysis. And anemias can be hereditary. And some of the anemias, particularly the one we're going to talk about that's hereditary, sickle cell. Okay, and that's, that's a nasty one, but that's also a form of anemia. So let's talk about the signs and symptoms. All of the anemias have commonalities with regard to the symptoms and signs they have. So your patient will have pallor. In other words, they're going to look pale. Your patient will have tachycardia because the heart says, where's all the blood? We don't have enough oxygenated blood. Beat faster. So heart rate will go up, tachycardia. They're going to be short of breath. So that's going to cause them to have an increased respiratory rate, tachypnea. Um, and because of all these things, you're going to find they're anxious or irritable, tired all the time, right? We talked about shortness of breath. And they're always going to be intolerant to cold. So everyone in the room could be comfortable, and the person with anemia will be freezing. So, you know, those are the signs and symptoms that they all share. Now. There are some signs and symptoms that are different, like over and above those with different anemias. For example, pernicious anemia, yes, it's got all those other signs and symptoms I just described, but also neurological involvement. So pernicious anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, is usually age-related and secondary to a decrease in intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is something that's made in the gut. So you have intrinsic factor from the stomach and extrinsic factor from the small bowel, and you need those in order to absorb B12 from the foods that you eat. With age, the production of the increases. If the patient has had any type of gastric surgery, so like anything for weight loss, like a lap band procedure or a gastric bypass, that it decreases the size of the stomach, well, smaller stomach, not as much intrinsic factor, B12 deficiency. So they can eat all the food in the world with B12, but they won't be able to absorb it. And then the other reason would be, say, stomach cancer. So if they have gastric cancer and they have a partial or total gastrectomy, removal of part or all of the stomach, and yes, that's possible, then they're not going to have intrinsic factor. And again, doesn't matter what they eat, they can't absorb it without 
that intrinsic factor. So the B12, they can't increase it in their diet. It's not going to help. They're going to need a vitamin B12 injection for the rest of their lives. Okay. So now we talk about the symptoms, neurological symptoms, in addition to the power, the tachycardia, the tachypnea, and all those. Patient will have numbness in hands, feet, fingers, paresthesias, which are those, the tingling, right? They will have possibly cognitive changes. So in other words, the patient, you know, Mrs. Jones is, has been pretty much awake, alert, and oriented, and now she's starting to get confused. And there's no real reason why, because remember, confusion and dementia is not a normal part of the aging process or she's having sudden difficulty ambulating where she was pretty steady before. All of these things can be signs of a B12 deficiency. And if they're not recognized early on, the patient's symptoms are irreversible. So if the patient's having difficulty walking, we don't address it right away. She may not be able to walk forever. Cognitive changes can be permanent, right? They're not reversible. And then the other symptom is this red, irritated, beefy looking tongue, right? Not quite glossitis, but it's just, it's kind of like sore and enlarged, okay? So that's pernicious anemia symptoms above the typical anemia symptoms. And then with iron deficiency anemia, things that you will see above the other symptoms are in the mouth, fissures. So a fissure is kind of like a crack, right? But it's a deep crack, right? So she'll have fissures. He or she can have fissures in their mouth, oral mucosa, glossitis. So the tongue will be irritated and sore, but not swollen and beefy like it is with pernicious anemia. And here's a fun thing. Their nails kind of look like spoons. Yeah, Google image that. It's pretty cool looking. I mean, not cool for the patient, but... These are things that help us be able to look at a patient and diagnose what could be happening. Well, and then what tests do we use? So for diagnostic tests, the CBC, we want to take a look and see, you know, what is their red blood cell count? So what's the reticulocyte count? What is the erythrocyte count? Hemoglobin, hematocrit, all of those things we're looking at. Um, a bone marrow analysis is sometimes indicated, which means that we would have to do a bone marrow biopsy. Bone marrow biopsy is a topic that the Board of Nursing likes to ask about, and ATI, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But uh, it's a painful procedure to go in and take a portion of someone's bone marrow. We want to analyze it at the lab and see, is it functioning the way it's supposed to be functioning, right? Or is there maybe a cancer happening? Um, and if, it's, if they're losing blood, if it's something that's apparent or that you would think is apparent, so somebody who got stabbed or shot, it's pretty obvious that they're losing blood. Someone who is having a postpartum hemorrhage, they're bleeding. Internal bleeding, so think about it. After, say, any type of abdominal surgery, if you were to assess a rigid and firm and distended abdomen, the bells and alarms should go off in your head that that is a, a classic sign of internal hemorrhage. Okay, so that of course can lead to anemia. So if it's one of those things, obviously we have to fix that and then we fix the anemia, right? Okay, what else do we have to do for the patient? Therapeutic interventions are gonna be, of course, eliminate the cause once we figure out what that is, possibly dietary changes, supplements, and then of course, all else, we're gonna possibly give them a blood transfusion. Slide 10 goes over some nursing diagnoses. You can take a look at those. I'm going to talk briefly about each type of anemia. So, first one is aplastic anemia. And that is usually congenital. It's not very common. I'll make this short and sweet. With aplastic anemia, bone marrow is not producing red blood cells. Usually congenital. It can also be because of toxins, occupational toxins that they've been exposed to, or even chemotherapy to, to um, you know, resolve a cancer. Uh, signs and symptoms, the same in general, the weakness, the fatigue, the power, the shortness of breath, et cetera, et cetera. But they will typically experience ecchymosis, you know, bruising, right? Um, petechiae, which are the little red dots that indicate bleeding, sometimes even frank bleeding. Frank, when we say it, it's not a guy's name. 
frank bleeding means we can actually visualize red blood coming out of their body. All right. And it can lead to death if it's not treated. Again, not, not one of the more common ones, but I did want to talk to you about it. And so, you know, when you look at the diagnostic test, same thing, bone marrow biopsy, CBC, treatment, treat the cause. Colony stimulating factors are the things like filgrastim and epoetin alpha. So in other words, the medications that we can give someone to help their marrow produce red blood cells or white blood cells or even granulocytes, uh, thrombocytes. Um, so know that. The next one I want to talk about is sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is different in many ways. Uh, it's inherited, totally congenital, and both parents must have the trait in order for the child to have sickle cell. So if you have a male and a female who both possess the sickle cell trait and they have a child, that child is going to have sickle cell. If one person has the trait and the other does not, the child will not have sickle cell, but they may get the trait also. So that's something important for them to know, for the child to know, so that this way when they're of childbearing age or reproductive age, if it's a man, do they want to make sure that the person that they're with does not possess the trait also, because then they're going to have a child with sickle cell, okay? So diagnostic tests, um, sickle dex test, um, don't worry so much about those, but the treatment. ATI and the board like to ask about treatment and nursing interventions. What do we do for the patient in sickle cell crisis? So a sickle cell crisis, what happens is normal red blood cells are an oval shape and they kind of have a concave part on the top of them. It's like a cup almost that holds the heme, right? So you have a red blood cell that's like a concave disc and with a little cup area, the heme attaches in there. That's the hemoglobin. When a crisis occurs, the red blood cells change shape. And instead of being that oval shape, they start to stretch out and become sickled. So they kind of look like a crescent moon. Or where the name originates from is from a sickle, which if you've ever seen a photo of the Grim Reaper, the Grim Reaper carries a sickle. It is a, an old-fashioned tool that's used to harvest wheat. So it's shaped kind of like a thin, long, uh, it's like a thin, long blade that looks like a crescent moon. Well, that's what happens to the cells. When they're shaped like that, a couple things happen. Number one, well, there's no more cup for them to carry the heme anymore or oxygen. So they're useless and they can't fit into the blood vessels. The blood vessels are shaped to fit exactly the shape of the red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets. So when these cells start to sickle, they start to agglutinate, agglutinate or aggregate. So in other words, they all clump together and they'll clump together because they're trying to get into the blood vessel, but they can't fit. For me to describe the amount of pain that is associated with a sickle cell crisis, I, I don't even think I can. I've treated patients in the ER. It's just, they can be screaming and it's pain everywhere because you have blood everywhere. And so pain management, pain management and blood transfusion, fluids and oxygen. Just remember those four things because you've got to manage their pain. They're in agonizing, agonizing pain. Transfusions, they are going to quickly need red blood cells that are shaped the right way that can carry oxygen. Because think about it, when they're in crisis, their cells and tissues and organs aren't getting any oxygen or definitely not enough oxygen because all those other cells are shaped wrong, right? So we have to give them a transfusion pretty quickly. Sickle cell patients typically get a lot of transfusions in their lifetime, sadly. Fluids, because the blood gets thick, right? So we're gonna make sure that they're getting plenty of fluids to try to thin it out a little bit. And of course, supplemental oxygen right away because they are going to be hypoxic. So what causes a sickle cell crisis? I know that I've said this before. I'm going to say it again, that if anything's going to kill you, stress is right up there in the top, at least two or three. Because when you are stressed out, people with sickle cell, if they get stressed, 
really highly emotional situations like a death in the family or something like that, they can go into crisis. Exposure to extreme cold. So don't go skiing if you have sickle cell. That's a double whammy because it's cold and it's high altitudes. So they need to stay away from high altitudes. They shouldn't go to the mountains. They shouldn't participate in any cold weather activities. Cold and high altitudes can trigger a sickle cell crisis. And then strenuous exercise. They, they really cannot overdo it because their body will just not be able to handle it. Um, and for some of them, we'll give hydroxyurea. Don't worry about that. And sometimes we'll give prophylactic transfusions to prevent a crisis. And so take a look at the nursing diagnoses, you know, tissue perfusions, inadequate and acute pain. What are we going to teach the patient? Well, we're going to make sure they know, you know, stay away from tight clothing, don't have strenuous exercise, alcohol, stay away from alcohol, stay away from cigarettes, stay away from cold temperatures and high altitudes, stay away from an unpressurized aircraft. So when we fly in an airplane, when we get inside the airplane, the cabin will become pressurized. So because the higher the altitude that you go, the pressure starts to decrease in the air. The air actually becomes thinner the higher up you are. And so the cabin will pressurize so that we don't feel it as much. So they cannot travel on any kind of aircraft that is not, doesn't have a pressurized cabin. So in other words, regular airplanes all have pressurized cabins. So they shouldn't be going into a helicopter. No pressure in the cabin, right? Okay. And then exposure to infection because infection and illness and stress, like I said, can, can trigger a crisis. Next thing we're going to talk about polycythemia vera, also, also known as PV. This is a weird one. It's where the body is making too many red blood cells. And so there's so many red blood cells getting pumped out that the white blood cells and platelets are diminished, right? There's not enough room for them. You'll see hemoglobins above 18, hematocrits are greater than 55% because the blood is starting to get viscous. It's getting thick. So there's primary and secondary. Primary means that you have it because it's congenital. Secondary means it's happening because of a disease process. Another disease. But don't worry so much about that. Just understand what it is, right? And the treatment. So, I mean, when we talk about the signs and symptoms, um, they're going to have high blood pressure because their blood is so thick, the heart can't get it through the blood vessels. They're going to have sometimes visual changes, a headache, that's because of the lack of blood flow, dizziness, vertigo, right, tinnitus ringing in the ears. Their skin will always look kind of reddish or flushed, and sometimes itching, shortness of breath, chest pain, all those things because the blood is thick, too many red blood cells, and they're not doing their job, okay? What do we do? Bloodletting. Don't laugh. The patient, the typical treatment is the patient's going to go and have phlebotomy done. We're going to remove some of that extra blood two or three times a week. Yep, yeah, it's the truth. Um, so, and sometimes we'll keep them on a low dose aspirin to prevent aggregation of platelets, right? Or the red blood cells. Try to keep the blood a little bit less viscous. But phlebotomy, remember that for polycythemia vera, we're going to actually remove the extra blood twice or three times a week. And yes, for the rest of their life, if it's a primary disease process, right? If it's a secondary, we're going to treat the cause. Make sure they're drinking plenty of fluids, three liters of water, 3,000 mils, no restrictive clothing. And then of course, report any signs and symptoms of bleeding. Real quickly, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, not going to get into a lot of depth. You may or may not get a question about this, but you should at least have heard of it. So DIC usually comes with trauma. We used to see it in the trauma center frequently, unfortunately. What happens is, at, right after a severe trauma, major trauma, the body will start accelerating all of its clotting factors. So your blood wants to clot prothrombin and platelets and vitamin K. All the clotting factors and, and platelets will start to just be produced and make the blood clot. So the patient will start to clot crazy clots. But then all of a sudden, 
all the clotting factors just get depleted and the patient will actually, and this is a fact, bleed to death. They will bleed out eyes, nose, ears, mouth, vagina, urethra, anus, any opening. They will just bleed to death. I've seen it progress to that point twice. It's, it's horrific. So just know what it is. You can read through it, but I'm not going to test you on it. I just want to make sure that you have at least heard of it. Slide 27 shows you when we talk about ecchymosis with somebody with DIC, it's bad. We're talking about bruising that huge black and blue marks, okay? And to diagnose it, we're going to be checking their blood for, you know, PT, prothrombin time, partial thromboplastin time, PTT, check their platelet count, hemoglobin, and even creatinine because we'll see creatinine levels elevate because of all the waste product and, and the strain on the kidneys. Okay. All right. That's enough of DIC. I don't want to get into that. And I'm not even going to talk about idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. It's just, it's a weird, rare disease where people just get bleeding just, and it's autoimmune, we think. So in other words, their platelets are getting destroyed by their immune system and they just, they bleed under the skin. They'll have petechiae and bruising and that type of thing. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that one. We have bigger fish to fry. Slide 36 is important. Okay, make sure you look at this one. Bleeding precautions, electric razor, soft toothbrush, no invasive procedures, avoid an injection, oral meds, right? Maintain pressure if you have to get their blood so they don't bleed out. Always cover their feet, shoes, slippers, Avoid bumps, bruises, home safety, don't fall, no aspirin, no NSAID, stool softeners. Be gentle with the patient. Any little thing can make a patient on bleeding precautions bleed. This applies to people with hematological disorders, coagulopathies, in other words, a problem with coagulation. Or remember, this applies to people that are on anticoagulants like warfarin or heparin or noxaparin. Next, we'll talk about hemophilia. Hemophilia is another inherited congenital disease. Uh, both parents have got to have the trait. There are three types of hemophilia, A, B, and C. A is the most common one, usually males. And it's usually, like I said, A, they have a deficiency in a particular clotting factor. So you have 12 clotting factors that all work together with prothrombin, thromboplastin, fibrinogen, vitamin K, platelets, and these 12 clotting factors, they all work together so that your blood can clot, so that if you get a cut or something happens, you don't just bleed to death, okay? So hemophilia A, they are deficient in factor eight, okay? I just want you to know that. Hemophilia A is von Willebrand's disease. They're deficient in factor eight. Hemophilia B, if you ever see a question about Christmas disease, yes, that's what it's known as, factor nine. And then hemophilia C is factor 11, and they are all hereditary. But really, focus, hemophilia A is the most common one, and it's factor eight deficiency. We give infusions of factor eight, okay, so that they don't bleed to death. Signs and symptoms, classic, classic, swollen, painful joints especially the knees, because what that tells us is they've had bleeding issues before, and the bleeding can be internally. You don't have to see the blood. So with a hemophiliac, they can be bleeding into their joints, and then the joint will swell up. So we see swollen joints. That tells us this patient has had bleeding issues internally before. Um, they will have, um, you know, bleeding into their tissue, even bleeding into their brain when they become symptomatic. So again, hemophilia, hereditary. The one you really want to concentrate on is A, von Willebrand's. They lack factor eight. And the treatment, infusions of factor eight. Okay, that was pretty simple, I think. All right, I want to move on to leukemia. And leukemia is cancer of the blood. Um, there is, with all leukemias, there are actually four types of leukemias, all of them share the commonality that there is a sudden increase in production 
of immature white blood cells. So the bone marrow is pumping out all these baby white blood cells, but they're useless. It's like taking a bunch of babies and putting little suits on them and sending them out to war. They can't fight, right? So this is what's happening here. The body's pumping out all these white blood cells, but they're absolutely useless. Um, usually with leukemia, it's genetic. And we'll talk about the different types briefly. Don't spend a lot of time on this. I will just let you know that when we talk about childhood leukemia, that's acute lymphocytic leukemia. It's, it's not good. And that's usually onset of ages two to eight years old. Okay, that's the one that you hear about. Not good. When we talk about older people, people say over the age of 43 or so, we're talking about either chronic lymphocytic or chronic myelogenous. And just chronic myelogenous, that's a bad one because both of them are bad, but the chronic myelogenous one progresses really quickly. So it doesn't have a good prognosis. And with leukemia, as with any type of cancer, usually we're going to treat it with chemotherapy, radiation, bone marrow transplants are working out beautifully um, if they can find a donor. So I have been a bone marrow donor since 1999 and have not been called once. Isn't that crazy? So I'm on the United States bone marrow donation list. So if they needed a donor, if somebody needed a donor and they, and they were a match with me, I would have gotten called. So it's really hard to find a match. But if you can find a match, bone marrow transplant works wonders. And then stem cells. I'm not even going to get into stem cells. It's very controversial, or at least it has been. But anyway, so we're going to move on. Multiple myeloma is cancer of the plasma cells in the marrow. And I'm not, I don't want to get into detail, but just be familiar with the term. I'm not going to test you on it. So I'm not really even going to go over it. But what happens is it's, it's a bad type of cancer that happens in older people typically. And the bone actually looks like cobblestones. It kind of gets eaten away because of the destruction of the plasma cells inside the bone marrow. All right, we're almost done. We're going to talk about lymphomas, cancers of the lymphatic system. Okay, you've got Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. Okay, and really I'm going to fast forward to slide. There is a side-by-side. Uh, -side. Okay, so slide 65, just jump ahead to that one. So of the two, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is bad. They're both bad, but non-Hodgkin's, very, very poor prognosis. People typically will die from non-Hodgkin's. It's usually people over the age of 50 that get this. And there's one thing that I do like to talk about, Reed Sternberg cells. So try to make this one as easy as possible. Children or teenagers, I should say, that get mono, mononucleosis, the kissing disease, right? um, which is a viral infection, have the presence of these Reed Sternberg cells. And the same way the chicken pox can lay asleep dormant in the body and then wake up as shingles years later, these Reed Sternberg cells, when the patients had mono, they can sleep and then they can wake up later on and cause chronic fatigue syndrome, which is also known as Epstein-Barr, or worse, Hodgkin's lymphoma, we find these Reed Sternberg cells in patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma. The good news is with treatment, Hodgkin's is, is good prognosis, usually very, very treatable and usually good outcomes. So just the important thing about these is understanding what the disease process is and understanding which one is the deadlier one and the Reed Sternberg cells. And then one more thing, when I talk about having good nursing assessment skills, and I can't say this you know, enough to all of you. You are sometimes the only thing that stands between the patient and the grave. And I'm not kidding when I say that. So you really need to give that careful consideration. 
Um, I know that you see nurses sometimes where it doesn't really look like, you know, that's, that's what's going on there, but that's really the responsibility that we have. And the reason I'm saying that is because with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, one of the earliest symptoms is painless lymph node enlargement. So you have cervical lymph nodes that run right along here, okay? When you're doing an assessment on a patient, you should be palpating. They feel when they're enlarged, kind of like peas under the skin, right? And you would ask, you know, are these tender? Does this hurt? If the patient says yes, that's a good thing because lymph nodes will enlarge with infection. So maybe they have a cold or the flu or some kind of infectious process. But if they say no, they don't hurt, you need to tell the doctor right away. Painless, especially cervical lymph adenopathy. Lymph adenopathy means swollen, painless lymph nodes is one of the first signs. You might be able to save somebody's life. Okay. All right. That's it for this chapter. Ta-ta for now. See you next time.